Hi, I'm Zeev, a PhD student at CMU, and today I'm going to tell you about a new result to do with the Gittins policy. This is joint work with my advisor, Mar Harkel Walter. So here's what this talk is about in a nutshell. The Gittins policy is a scheduling algorithm, in this case for an MG1Q, um, that solves a wide variety of scheduling problems in that queue. So uh, for example, it's going to help minimize mean response time and other variations of, of, on that theme. And lots of people have written papers showing that Giddens is optimal in this setting, in that setting, all sorts of different twists on the problem. But all of these prior results have limitations. So for example, there are some areas that remain unexplored, and there are other areas that have been explored, but proofs only go through under certain limiting assumptions. And so what our work is about, it's about unifying and generalizing all of these prior optimality results. We state one theorem, which encompasses all of the previously stated Gittins optimality results, and we give a new proof that doesn't have these uh, limitations that previous proofs did. So um, let's get into it. So I'm going to start by telling you about the MG1Q, which is the queuing model we're going to be working with in this talk. So we've got a single server, which can serve one job at a time, and a queue, which can hold any number of jobs waiting. This is what a job looks like. We're going to draw it like a test tube whose height is its size or service requirement. That's how long we need to serve the job before it completes, and we'll represent that service as filling the job with water. So the amount of service a job has received so far is its age, and the rest of the job is its remaining size. And so we've got jobs randomly arriving over time. Specifically, MG1, um, that means that there's a size distribution, which in general could, could be anything. Um, there's some arrival rate lambda, um, and we, we have a Poisson process of arrivals. And this gives the system load rho equals lambda times E of S. This is the fraction of time the server has to be busy and has to be less than one for the system to be stable. So that's the basics of the MG1Q. Um, and today what we're going to be concerned with is scheduling in the MG1. So the scheduling policy at every moment in time picks one job to serve, and it can do so preemptively. So we can decide to switch out one job and start serving another. And uh, preemption has no penalty in our model. So the metric we're going to be concerned with is response time. So a job's response time is the time from when it first arrives to when it leaves all complete. And so a single job's response time is going to be affected by the scheduling policy we choose, because the scheduling policy decides when that job is in service and when it has to wait in the queue. And our goal today is going to be to minimize metrics like mean response time. So mean response time is the average response time over all jobs in a long arrival sequence. And so we're going to be minimizing metrics like mean response time. So let's start with specifically talking about how should we minimize mean response time. And let's start with a very simple case of we know every job's size, age, and remaining size. So in this setting, this is a kind of classic problem. And to minimize mean response time, the optimal policy is called SRPT, stands for shortest remaining processing time. It always serves a job of least remaining size. The intuition here is that whichever job you can get out of your system the fastest, that's the job you should serve if you want to minimize this to sort of total waiting time of jobs that occurs. And so I like to visualize SRPT in the following way as what's called a rank function. So here a job's rank is its priority. It's a number where lower is better. And so to visualize SRPT as a rank function, I might say a job of size 4 starts at rank 4 and its rank will be its remaining size. I'm always serving the job of lowest rank, least remaining size. So a job uh, of size four will start at rank four, and then as its age increases, its rank decreases at slope one until it reaches zero when the job completes. Similarly, a job of size nine, uh, its rank would look like this. A job of size two, its rank would look like that. And so this is SRPT, and a nice way to visualize it. And it's been shown that SRPT minimizes mean response time. This is a classic result uh, shown in the 1960s. OK, so SRPT is a pretty, uh, pretty simple policy, and it's a pretty simple proof of optimality. Things get a lot hairier when we go to unknown job sizes, where we like don't know the heights of the test tubes. So how do we schedule when we have unknown job sizes? So the first question we should ask is, what information is even available to us when designing a scheduling policy? So one piece of information that's available is the age of each job. We can track how long we've served each job so far. That's easy to do. Another piece of information that's available is the overall distribution of job sizes. Even if we don't know any individual job size that's in our system right now, it's reasonable to assume that, say, based on historical data, 
we know the overall distribution of job sizes. And so the name of the game when scheduling with unknown job sizes is leveraging each job's age and the size distribution S in order to design an optimal policy. And so, um, and so this problem has been studied in the past and a policy called Gittins, that's right, this is the Gittins policy in the title of the talk, uh, the policy Gittins uh, is, is optimal for minimizing mean response time. So what Gittins does is it works kind of like SRBT. It computes each job's rank as a function of its age. And exactly what this function looks like depends on the size distribution. So we can draw Gittins as another rank function. Um, again, rank is a number, it's priority, lower is better. But it's not going to be as simple as SRPT. It might be something that goes up and down, um, and exactly the details of what the rank function looks like depend on the size distribution. But um, what's been shown is that um, Gittins basically gives the optimal way to design a rank function, and moreover, that optimal way of designing a rank function is in fact the optimal policy and minimizes mean response time. And this has uh, been shown independently by, by several folks in the 1970s. Uh, here I'm citing Gittins' 1989 paper, um, but he was developing these ideas um, earlier on. Uh, sorry, 1989 book. Okay, so um, speaking of all these different proofs of Gittins optimality, um, let's get to talking about some other Gittins optimality results. So, so far I've told you that Gittins minimizes mean response time in a setting where we've got unknown job sizes, general size distribution, and preemptive service, where we're allowed to interrupt jobs and switch them out uh, for other jobs. Um, and, but even these uh, kind of three initial Gittins results that I've, uh, I've told you about already, um, go beyond just this simple mean response time metric. In particular, they uh, involve uh, different ways of giving jobs different weights, different importances. So for example, um, so, so for example, Gittins in his book in 1989 shows not just that Gittins minimizes mean response time, but that if you've got multiple job classes with each job's weight based on its class, then then, uh, then a version of the Gittins policy actually minimizes mean weighted response time. Uh, and in fact, the Sevchik result from 1971 um, goes a bit further than this and actually uh, also applies not just to unknown job sizes, but also to a setting when you have known job sizes, um, in which case it it's actually ends up being a bit simpler. It's kind of like a variant of SRPT. Okay, and then uh, similarly, uh, Von Olivier uh, goes a bit further in this case, uh, showing that Gittins is optimal even when a job's weight is based on its size. Okay, um, but we can go beyond even like the types of things I've listed on the slide already. So for example, you can view some prior results, some more basic scheduling algorithms as special cases of Gittins, like SRPT or the CMU rule. So for example, SRPT is when you have known job sizes, general size distribution, preemptive service, and then all jobs weights are equal and, and all job types are the same. So SRPT minimizes mean response time, which is this scheduling problem. Similarly, the CMU rule is optimal for uh, mean weighted response time when either you have uh, preemptive service and exponential service times or non-preemptive service and general service times. Okay, and we can go even further than this. So for example, Klimov and Lian Ying both studied versions of the problem of the scheduling problem where now jobs don't just have multiple classes, they actually go through multiple stages. And you can think of it like a job cycles through multiple classes and spends some time in this class, then a bit more time in that class and so on and so forth. And each of them proves a version of Gittins is optimal for their version of the problem. All right, so these are the different optimality results. But um, there are some corners of the space that have yet to be explored. So for example, it's well known that uh, Gittins is optimal with unknown job sizes, and you know, Gittins is also optimal with known job sizes, often in the form of SRPT or some variant thereof. What if we don't have either of those extremes? What if we have something like noisily estimated job sizes? If you ask any expert on the Gittins policy, they'll say, oh yeah, Gittins should still be optimal in that case and they can even like define what the policy should be, but it's never been rigorously proven. Similarly, uh, when you have, in terms of different uh, service disciplines, if you have preemptive or non-preemptive service, what if you have something in between, 
where jobs can sometimes be preempted, but other times can't be preempted. And for example, if a job has certain non-preemptible segments, what happens then? Um, Similarly, with job weights, we've considered different ways of setting a job's weight. But what if a job doesn't just have one weight, but it changes as you serve it? What happens then? So part of the issue with all of these prior results is that they paint a general picture of Gittins and its optimality, but they don't cover all the different things we might hope, we might hope to. Another issue they have is that actually all of these results have some type of limiting assumption. So for example, um, all of the uh, results that deal with different classes have to make an assumption like there being finitely many job classes. And so if you want to have like a continuum of job classes, that's not possible. So that's, in, so, uh, that's what prevents us from encoding things like noisy size estimates as classes, because all of these results only apply to finitely many classes. Another limitation is that um, all of these results that point to general size distributions a lot of the time they have to actually make a technical assumption that limits this. So for example, um, for example, bound, uh, bounding the size distribution by some upper bound, saying there's some global maximum job size. And so the kind of, so the kind of takeaway is that there's been a lot of work on the Giddens policy. And the Giddens policy is kind of, uh, gives, it's a, it's less one policy and more a general policy construction that gives kind of an optimal rank function for mean weighted response time in all of these different settings. But there are still some settings that are unexplored and some limiting assumptions that results proven already have. So what we do is we solve both of those problems. We unify and generalize all of these prior optimality results and get rid of the limiting assumptions. So for so in a picture, we our result covers all of these concerns and more. And um, and so the kind of key obstacle we actually had to overcome um, wasn't really in figuring out like what should the Giddens policy be, right? If you ask any expert on the Giddens policy, they could tell you, you know, for various settings what the Giddens policy is supposed to be. Um, but the kind of main obstacle we had was coming up with a general enough definition that allowed us to state all of this stuff on the prior slide as just one theorem. And the kind of key idea we came up with was a very general notion of what job means. And so in the rest of this talk, I'm going to go over our very general definition of job and then use it to state our very general uh, theorem of Gittins' optimality. And then for the proofs and more details, you can see the paper. So here's our general job model. The key idea is that a job is a Markov process. And this is not just a Markov chain with finitely many states, this is a general Markov process with a general state space. And so the intuition here is that a job's state encodes everything we know about the job when scheduling it. So for example, uh, if we know the size of a job, then the size is part of the state. If we, um, if we know the age of the job, then the age is part of the state. If we know that uh, a job has like a size estimate, then that estimate is part of the state. If we receive an update halfway through running the job that actually now our estimate has changed, then that change is reflected in the state. And so the job state is actually going to stochastically evolve with service according to basically any Markovian dynamics. And so the way serving a job works is we serve the job, it follows some stochastic path, and eventually that path is going to reach a goal state, which represents completing the job. And so, um, and so this is kind of basically just a general absorbing Markov process. And so we layer on top of this general absorbing Markov process two more things. First, we say that some subset of the state space is allowed to be non-preemptible, that these represent states where like maybe the job is uninterruptible because it's in the middle of some important operation that shouldn't be interrupted. And so we represent that by just saying some subset of the states are non-preemptible. And then finally, every state has a holding cost. And so this is going to, this kind of generalizes the notion of various weighted response time metrics, um, but now allows us jobs holding cost to vary during service. Okay, so this is our very general job model. Um, and, the, and what we're going to be concerned with is scheduling these jobs to minimize the average holding cost. 
Um, but before I get to that, let's just go through some examples of what this job model might look like. So let's talk about what does this, what do known sizes look like in this job model? Well, in this case, a job is a, remember, a job is a Markov process. Its state is what we know about it. So if we have known sizes, then the state of a job is its remaining size. So we, the state space is like the positive real line. The goal state is at zero, right? When we reach remaining size zero, the job finishes. And the dynamics are just that a job advances towards completion, advances towards, towards state zero at rate one as we serve it. Okay, what about unknown size? So when we have unknown sizes, then basically the only thing we know about a job is its age. And the dynamics of when we serve a job, its age goes up, right? Because the age is the amount we've served it. But then at any moment in time, the job might complete, right? As soon as the age equals the size. We just don't know when that is. So the dynamics look like as we serve the job, its age increases at rate one until it suddenly, unexpectedly, jumps to the goal state. And these jump probabilities at each age are going to be determined by the size distribution. And if you're wondering how the size distribution comes into play in the known size world, there the size distribution determines the random initial state of the job. Okay, so these are two kind of very simple Markov processes, but you can imagine that in general, you can have a much more complicated job structure by using a more complicated Markov process. Also on top of either of these or something more complicated, you can layer any set of non-preemptible states and any holding cost. Okay, and so the theorem we prove is that Gittins minimizes mean holding cost in the MG1 with this very general model of jobs. So that is, if I'm scheduling an MG1 where I've got all these Markov process jobs, each at any moment in time is in some state, each of those states has a different holding cost, Gittins minimizes the average total holding cost of all of the jobs over a very long period of time in steady state. And so that's our main theorem. So in the paper, you can get more details about all of these definitions in addition to other content like how we actually define the rank of each state, that is how we define the Gittins policy. And you'll also find an extensive review of prior work where we go over exactly kind of what corners of the space have been explored and what limitations apply to those previous explorations. And then finally, we give a, of course, a new proof that applies in our very general setting. All right, that's my talk. Thanks for your attention. If you have any questions, um, feel free to email me at zscully at cs.cmu.edu. Thanks again.